Um, thanks, Margaret, and thanks for keeping us um, well, well organised and everything um, running. Apologies for the little bit of a late start, but we had late buses coming up because of the weather, um, et, et, et cetera. Uh, the Australian Association of Research in, in Education uh, wants to acknowledge formally to the membership those um, members who have deceased in the past year. So I'm shortly going to show a slide with the names of those people uh, who have passed uh, during 2014. Professor John Cleverley. Associate Professor Raymond Devers. Founding member and honorary life member, attended all AARE conferences till 2014. Professor Glenn Evans, honorary life member. Professor Donald Spirit, founding member of the association and honorary life member. I'd now like to invite <coughs> Elizabeth better known to us as Betty St. Pierre Adams, to present our morning keynote. Betty is Professor in Educational Theory and Practice. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Betty is the Professor in Educational Theory and the Practice Department and is an affiliated professor of both the Interdisciplinary Qualitative Research Program and the Women's Studies Institute at the University of Georgia in the USA. Betty is well known to Australian scholars, but we've never had her communicate to us to be here. So um, it's our pleasure to be able to welcome Betty to deliver this morning's keynote. Um, Betty's um, keynote um, will run and then there, we won't follow with questions because then we need to move into the doctoral awards as well. So I'd like to invite um, Betty to come forward and to present this morning's keynote. Good morning. I'm very happy to be with you today, and I especially want to thank the conference organizers for their hard work in getting us together here so we can help each other think. The title of my paper this morning <clears throat> is Post-Qualitative Inquiry, which is also the title of a chapter I wrote for the 2011 fourth edition of the SAGE Handbook of Qualitative Research. I deliberately use the rather large and ambiguous term post-qualitative for two reasons. The first was to mark what I believe is the impossibility of an intersection between what I've been calling conventional humanist qualitative methodology or 1980s qualitative methodology and postmodernism, post-structuralism, post-humanism and other post-theories I refer to together as the posts. The second was to announce that that impossibility can help clear the way for what I hope will be a multitude of different approaches to social science inquiry that might come after humanist qualitative methodology if one puts the post-structural critiques of humanist ontologies and epistemologies to work. When I wrote that chapter, I was well aware of the slippery politics of any critique of qualitative methodology, given the current neo-positivist status of educational research, policy, and practice in the US. In addition, conventional humanist 1980s qualitative methodology continues to be radical in US social science disciplines like psychology, political science, and economics. Further, I have certainly championed qualitative methodology for decades in my teaching and writing. My point is that I don't take lightly my critique of this methodology that has done much good work in educational research. But my critique comes from my own experience in teaching qualitative methodology for the last 20 years. At the University of Georgia, we offer a five-course sequence in qualitative research methodology 
and doctoral students who complete the sequence are awarded a certificate, which is supposed to qualify them to teach qualitative methodology once they enter the academy. I joined the faculty at the University of Georgia in 1995, and since then I've taught our introductory course in qualitative methodology 17 times. But I also taught courses on postmodern theory, on Foucault and Derrida, <clears throat> and I sent our education students to our comparative literature department to take courses with Ronald Bogue, who is an internationally renowned Deleuzian scholar. Over the years, students who had diligently studied post-structural and post-modern theories struggled and failed to, to reconcile those theories with humanist qualitative methodology. So in 2003, I developed a counter course, post-qualitative research, that is not grounded in humanist qualitative methodology to support those students. And the content of that course has changed over the years as we all got smarter about how one might inquire using the posts. I completely understood my students' dilemma in not being able to reconcile humanist qualitative methodology with the posts because I had also experienced that disconnect as a doctoral student. A, doc a disconnect, I believe, occurs because our educational research curriculum generally separates epistemology and ontology from methodology. Like my students, I had studied two bodies of knowledge simultaneously but separately, post-structural and postmodern theories on the one hand and humanist qualitative methodology on the other. And like my students, I had been unable to plug my post-structural dissertation study into qualitative methodology because the epistemology and ontology of the posts simply do not align with a humanist methodology. For example, when I wrote the methods section of my dissertation, I first presented my study as a conventional humanist qualitative study and then immediately deconstructed that description using Deleuze's lovely concept, the fold. As is often the case for me, it was in the thinking that writing produces that I first understood that the concepts that structure humanist qualitative methodology, concepts like the human subject, the interview, the observation, the voices of participants, the field, data, data analysis, member check, validity, systematicity, and so on, all those concepts were not thinkable in the posts. As Foucault might say, those concepts exist in a humanist grid of intelligibility, but not in post-structuralism. So for me, humanist qualitative methodology failed the first time I tried to use it in my post-structural dissertation study. And in the first two papers I published in 1997, I used Deleuze's concept, the fold, to deconstruct data, and his concepts, the nomad and smooth space, to deconstruct the field. I told someone not long ago that I read Deleuze and Guattari's Transcendental Empiricism, their experimental ontology too soon, so early in my doctoral studies that conventional humanist qualitative methodology was ruined from the start. <laughs> of course, other researchers who had taken up the post deconstructed other concepts of qualitative methodology. For example, Patty Lather deconstructed validity Jim Sherrick deconstructed the interview, and Wanda Pillow deconstructed reflexivity. Many of you at this conference were doing the same. We said we were using the posts to work the ruins of humanist epistemology, ontology, and methodology. But I believe we worked those ruins for too long. Those of us using post-structural theories seemed unable to just leave the ruined structure of humanist qualitative methodology behind and do something different from the beginning. Why did we continue to try to make humanist qualitative methodology work for our post-structural studies? Looking back, I think we in the US at least had been so well trained in conventional humanist qualitative methodology that we could not think outside it. For that reason, I am much more aware now of how very difficult it is to escape our training, how difficult it is to leave behind sacred concepts like method and data, how difficult it is to deformalize, de 
everyday practices like talking with and observing people and how difficult it is to make these new turns some of us are trying to make, the ontological turn, the material turn, the new empirical turn. Another reason I think those of us who use post-structural theories were stuck in humanist qualitative methodology for so long is that we believed our methodological choices were between an interpretive qualitative methodology and a positivist quantitative methodology. So we chose qualitative methodology thinking we might be able to deconstruct it, to open it up just enough to make it work with the posts. I think that was not only wishful thinking but also a fatal mistake because by hanging on to a prescribed methodology, we ignored the very serious and sustained post-structural critique of method. Continuing to embrace qualitative methodology prevented us from imagining different kinds of inquiry that were not grounded in humanism's ontology and epistemology. I'll return to this problem later, but first I want to set the stage for my call for post-qualitative methodology by briefly reviewing the history of qualitative methodology in the U.S. I'm not sure how this maps onto your experiences, and I'd enjoy talking with you about that later. It's important to remember that 1980s qualitative methodology in the U.S. was part of the larger interpretive turn in our social sciences that drew heavily from the interpretive anthropology introduced in 1973 with Clifford Gertz's still stunning book, The Interpretation of Cultures. Gertz told us that in interpretive anthropology, we don't just find and then describe or represent culture in our research reports, rather we inscribe culture as we write it, we make it in our texts. That understanding ushered in what Gertz called the burden of authorship what Marcus and Fisher call the crisis of representation and what Habermas call the legitimation crisis. After the interpretive turn, our research reports could no longer be naive, innocent, transparent reflections of what really is, but were always already partial, contingent, and potentially dangerous fictios, fictions, our interpretations of research participants' interpretations of interpretations they found in their cultures and used in living. What this means for interpretive social scientists is that even if we invent 10 or 20 different research designs, even if we follow a trusted, well-defined research process, even if we improve our research methods so we can go deeper and be more accurate, even if we interview the same participant five or 10 or 15 times, hoping to reconcile discrepancies, even if we observe in the same research setting for one or two or five years to uncover its authentic culture, even if we do all that, we can never get to the bedrock of truth because there's no final truth, no brute datum out there to be found. What we have at the end of field work and analysis is not a solid finding, but rather interpretation piled on interpretation piled on interpretation. All we can ever get in interpretive social science is today's story, what the participant thinks today, what we observe today, which might well change in six weeks or six months, and we have to be content with that. Such is the nature of interpretive social science. And why should we expect more? Isn't life like that? Messy and unpredictable. Don't we change our, change our minds about what we think from one day to the next, from week to week, from year to year? Aren't we constantly reinterpreting our lived experiences as we tell them to different people throughout our lives? And don't all those retellings change us as well? I surely hope so. As Foucault wrote, to be the same is really boring. Interpretive social science in the U.S. was radical in the 1970s. Many claimed it wasn't science at all, but it provided a powerful critique of the positivist social science that had thrived in our universities and disciplines like psychology, sociology, political science, and economics ever since the Vienna Circle logical positivists or logical empiricists brought it to the U.S. when they fled Europe in the run-up to World War II. 
invented between the two world wars in the 1920s and 30s by European economists, mathematicians, physicists, philosophers, and linguists, logical positivism was and still is attractive because it claims that the rigorous scientific methods of the natu natural sciences can find rules and laws in the social world as they, as they have in the natural world. In social science, positivism's desire is to predict what people will do and then control them. There were many disagreements among the Vienna Circle logical positivists, but they shared some basic assumptions that continue to structure the social sciences and education in the U.S. in the 21st century. The most important assumption, I believe, is the separation of science from philosophy. The logical positivists rejected philosophy, metaphysics, and whatever is non-observable, non-measurable, and speculative. In doing so, they rejected ideology critique like Marxism and theories that destabilize human reason like those of Freud. In general, the logical positivists believed in the verifiability principle of meaning, the idea that only that which can be seen and measured is valuable. <clears throat> Their empiricism claims that there is indeed such a thing as a brute datum, a sense datum, that is not subject to further interpretation, judgment, or contingency, and that truth can be found through the right use of rational methods. The Vienna Circle logical positivists also supported the following ideas, which will sound familiar, I believe. The belief that language could be clear and unambiguous. The use of prescribed, formal, exact methods, preferably mathematical. A belief in a unified theory of science that rejects a division between the natural and social sciences that observability entails objective, reproducible experiments, and a belief in incrementalism, the idea that knowledge steadily accumulates and the purpose of science is to fill gaps in the edifice of knowledge. Positivism maintains the Cartesian binaries of mind-body, self-other, rational-irrational, objective-subjective, human-non-human, and so on. To me, these ideas represent an age-old desire to get below the messy, contingent surface of human existence to a pristine, originary foundation, the bedrock of certitude. A belief in the power of scientific knowledge to cure the problems of human existence is, I would argue, a belief and not the truth. And as many scholars have noted, a science presumed to be separate from philosophy is simply another narrative in the service of power. To repeat, positivist social science dominated U.S. social science during the early decades of the 20th century until the identity politics and the social movements of the 1960s and 1970s began. The women's movement, the civil rights movement, the gay and lesbian movement, and other resistance movements that rejected the rational social scientist, uh, social scientist of positivism who claimed to be neutral and untouched by race, class, gender, sexuality, age, and so on. As the feminist Donna Haraway put it, there's no privilege God's eye view from nowhere. Haraway and others argued that knowledge is always situated, local, partial, and contingent, and cannot be replicated, generalized, and scaled up, as we like to say in education these days. Further, identity politics argued that contrary to positivist claims, all science, both social and natural, is contaminated by human values and desires and can never be objective. In other words, the researcher cannot not be there, and science is always a very human enterprise. So interpretive social science and interpretive qualitative methodology was invented in the U.S. in the 1970s and 80s to counter the positivist social science that had been dominant for decades. And it thrived until the beginning of the 21st century. For a number of years, in fact, more qualitative than quantitative research studies were presented at the American Educational Research Association and qualitative methodology became a powerful methodological machine in educational research. But a powerful backlash to interpretive social science and qualitative methodology 
began in the U.S. in 2000 with the passage of the No Child Left Behind Act, which introduced the concept scientifically based research in education, a description of research that is essentially positivist. Interestingly, but not surprisingly, the person who wrote the definition of scientifically based research in the federal law was neither a researcher nor an educator. As Foucault explained, politics and not rationality is often found at the beginning of things. Nonetheless, this political mover took everyone by surprise because it was her first time in our history that the federal government had mandated research methodology in federal law. The argument was that because educational researchers, especially qualitative researchers, had failed to produce knowledge that could tell us what works in schools and correct educational problems, the government had to intervene and use the force of law to make us use rigorous scientific methodologies. In fact, scientizing everything about education soon became the norm. The president of our National Academy of Sciences said in his 2001 presidential address that his goal was, in fact, to make education a science. To accomplish that, Grover Whitehurst was appointed as the first director of the new U.S. Institute of Educational Sciences that was created by NCLB. The Institute of Education Sciences was the new funding agency for educational research. Whitehurst immediately determined that causal research was the only kind of research that would help us learn what works in schools. Furthermore, he determined that the gold standard of causal research was a randomized controlled trial. Qualitative research was dismissed across the board as unscientific because, as some claimed, it's based on narratives and not on facts. <clears throat> During the decade after NCLB, the first decade of this 21st century, comments like, qualitative research can be interesting, but it's not science. Another comment was, we want to know what will work in any fifth grade classroom in the country. Don't keep telling us it's complicated. <laughs> the upshot of NCLB was that the US federal government would not fund qualitative research because it claimed its findings could not be scientifically based or evidence based. Qualitative research findings could not be generalized. They could not be scaled up. Qualitative studies described but did not measure, and rigorous science is supposedly based on numbers, not on words. What happened is that in order to get federal funding for educational research, many qualitative researchers proceeded to make their interpretive studies positivist by introducing positivist concepts and practices of formalization like bias, subjectivity statements, systematicity, audit trails, inter-rater reliability, coding data, and so on. Interpretive qualitative methodology, whose methods are supposed to be emergent, became methods-driven, linear, and systematic, following a predetermined research process, using predetermined research designs, like case study and focus, groups, focus group research. In this way, much interpretive qualitative methodology became positivist. But the federal government wasn't the only force that was positivizing qualitative methodology. During that first decade of the 21st century, the US publishing industry structured and normalized qualitative methodology by churning out hundreds of textbooks, handbooks, and journal articles. Uh, and universities produced research curriculum that described exactly what qualitative methodology is and exactly how to do it. Qualitative research conferences became popular. In our books and journal articles, we reduced qualitative methodology to a recipe. Just think of the chapter headings uh, of most introductory qualitative textbooks. Identify a research question whose answer will fill a gap in the literature. Choose a methodology that aligns with the question. Design the study choosing among five or six established research designs. Carefully follow the research process. Collect data, code data to identify themes and patterns that somehow miraculously emerge from the data. 
and then write up the study using the conventional research report format. The problem is that studies that follow that research process typically do not acknowledge their epistemological and ontological assumptions. They seldom use theory and analysis, and they often produce low-level, pedestrian, insignificant findings. By adopting the positivist stance of ignoring theory, by separating science and philosophy, these researchers seem unaware, for example, that it's not just that our research questions determine our methodology, it's that our ontoepistemologies determine the very questions we can ask, and more radically, whether we even believe in method. What is very clear now is that the positivist qualitative methodology that emerged in the U.S. after the 2000 No Child Left Behind Act that mandated scientifically based and evidence based everything is not the interpretive qualitative methodology that was invented in the 1980s. During the last 15 years or so, I've learned to my dismay that one can do a qualitative study without reading much theory at all. All you have to do is interview some people, the more the better. Transcribe the interviews word for word as if the words are somehow sacred. Code the interview data using a computer program. Counting the frequency of codes makes the study more scientific. Sort the coded data into categories or findings and then write a research report. We have, in the last 15 years or so, created, formalized, and sanctioned this kind of positivist qualitative research in the U.S. We also invented mixed methods research in order to, as my students tell me, sneak a qual small qualitative component into a larger quantitative study. In sum, this new stripped-down, methods-driven, a-theoretical, positivist qualitative research cannot be interpretive. Uh, this methodology does not make the interpretive turn away from positivism. And it certainly cannot accommodate post-structural theories. Nonetheless, I continue to see many new scholars struggle to make post-structuralism and humanist qualitative methodology work together. For example, I read research proposals in which a doctoral student proposes some awkward combination of an interview study and, a, and Foucauldian genealogy, although Foucault was very clear in his genealogies and archaeologies that he was interested not in the speaking subject, but in the conditions of discourse that enable what we can think and say. I review manuscripts and researchers describe a methods-driven, quasi-positivist study but introduce a Deleuzian concept like assemblage or bodies without organs in their literature reviews and then really can't use the concept because Deleuze's transcendental empiricism just bounces off the logical empiricism of their methodology. I read studies in research, uh, studies in which researchers claim to be using Derrida's deconstruction, but then they code data. It seems that these researchers who want to use post-structural theories don't know how to do an empirical don't know how to do empirical educational research without doing a qualitative, quantitative, or mixed method study. No matter what their onto epistemological commitments are, they believe their studies must fit into one of those methodological containers. Why does this happen? I thought a great deal about this, and I don't think it's a failure to learn, but a failure to teach. It's much easier, after all, to teach and learn ahistorical, a atheoretical, methods-driven research, a recipe you can count on, than it is to teach and learn epistemology and ontology. It's much easier to instruct students to choose among quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods research methodologies than it is to teach the history of science and the history of empiricism so they understand the history and politics of the methodological distinctions we've made. It's much easier to teach, say, interviewing and coding data than to teach what Alicia Jackson and Lisa Matze call thinking with theory. Our failure to teach and our students' failure to read means they have little to think with except the given, the self-evident. Our students who are theoretically impoverished are ill-equipped to critique dominant normalized structures Instead, 
they join what Leotard called the maintenance crews for the big explanatory machines, including normalized research methodology machines. For that reason, I argue that all researchers in both the social and the natural sciences should begin their studies not with methodology, but with the history of the ontoepistemologies that enable us to think such a thing as science, a history that allowed us to then separate science from philosophy, a history not based on rational decision making and scientific evidence, but shot through with power and politics. And I argue that beginning with that history is a requirement for those who want to do what I've called post-qualitative inquiry. This is because the post systems of thought do not have the same descriptions of reality, human being, language, knowledge, power, reason, agency, method, and other concepts that structure humanist systems of thought. When we do our reading and understand that the humanist descriptions of those concepts is only one set of descriptions among others, when we denaturalize and denormalize the assumptions of humanism, which is what the long post-structuralist revolution in the critical humanities and social science has been doing for over half a century, then we understand why we could work the ruins of conventional humanist qualitative methodology for a hundred years without escaping it. As Derrida advised, we have to overthrow the structure so that something different can happen. Humanist qualitative methodology then cannot accommodate research that uses post-structural, post-modern theories. Nor can humanist qualitative methodology accommodate the new work coming out of the recent ontological and material turns, work that has organized itself differently as, for example, affect theory, thing theory, actor network theory, assemblage theory, the new materialism, the new empiricism, and the post-human. Much of the new material, new empirical, post-human, post-qualitative work uses Deleuze and Guattari's flattened ontology, an ontological geography of surfaces, and a constellation of imbricated concepts such as rhizome, assemblage, plane of consistency, line of flight, abstract machine, and diagram that enable their transcendental empiricism. Working with deleuze guattarian concepts is not easy. For example, one can't understand a concept like diagram without understanding others it works with, like assemblage, abstract machine, and body without organs. It's like studying a foreign language. Just as you think you might understand a few concepts, Deleuze and Guattari throw more concepts at you. And a concept that's primary in one text, like sense in Deleuze's book, The Logic of Sense, may never be used again. We've been slow to take up and use Deleuze's and Deleuze and Guattari's ontology in the US social sciences, not only because, as Leotard noted, we're stuck in the positivism of this or that discipline, but also, I suspect, because their work was translated into English later than other 20, 20th century French theorists. In addition, Deleuze visited the US only once, whereas Foucault and Derrida for example, where frequent popular lecturers and translations of their work were quickly available. Most importantly, Deleuze and Guattari's work is deliberately ontological and difficult for those of us who've been so obsessed with methodology and epistemology that we've neglected to study ontology. My sense of things right now is that we're trying to make the ontological turn and the material turn in educational research, but we can't quite do it. We don't know how to do it. So we fall back on humanist research methodologies like qualitative methodology and try to plug Deleuze and Guattari's transcendental empiricism into those containers. But it just doesn't work. It never can. What we really want is a textbook with four or five handy research designs <laughs> for new empirical, new material, post-qualitative research. Of course, if such a book were written, it would be contrary to the very image of thought Deleuze and Guattari created. I completely agree with Maggie McClure 
that the shock of working within a materialist ontology has not yet been fully felt. But I'm convinced we won't be able to make the ontological turn and to make the new in the new empiricism until we just leave humanist qualitative methodology behind. We must try to forget it. And as I said earlier, that will be especially difficult for those of us who've been very well trained as qualitative methodologists. But we must remember that we invented qualitative methodology as an interpretive research methodology to counter positivist social science almost 30 years ago. We invented it. We made it up. It's not sacred. The sky won't fall if we just put it aside and try something different. First, we must understand that the ontologies of the new empiricisms and the post demand that we think differently about method. In 1979, Leotard wrote that he found postmodernism in America, and he defined postmodernism as an incredulity toward metanarratives, especially the privileged metanarrative of the positive value of modern science. Leotard was critical of positivist social science and its obsession with methods-driven inquiry, as were other scholars we label postmodern. And he argued that in the postmodern, method exists only in the future. So we should use the future anterior verb tense to talk about it. For this reason, method cannot exist before we begin a study. Instead, method is always what will have been done. I repeat, method is what will have been done. So method exists only at the end of our studies when we might try to explain what we did. Deleuze and Guattari did not believe in pre-existing method either. They wrote that a method is the striated space of the cogitatio universalis and draws a path that one must follow from one point to another. In other words, the very idea of method forces one into a prescribed, linear, systematic order of thought and practices that prohibits the experimental nature of their transcendental empiricism and of post-qualitative inquiry more generally. Method proscribes and prohibits. It controls and disciplines. Further, method always comes too late. It's immediately out of date and so is inadequate to the task at hand. But method not only can't keep up with events more seriously, it prevents them from coming into existence. Again, method, as we think of it in conventional humanist qualitative methodology, cannot be thought or done in new empirical, new material, post-qualitative inquiry. At this point, one might well ask if this new work doesn't use existing accepted scientific research methodologies, how do we know it's science? I would respond by saying that science exists only in a relation of power. When one group who claims to be scientists draws a line to exclude others they claim are not scientists. We certainly learned how this worked in recent US history when someone who, as I said, was neither an educator nor a researcher wrote a definition of scientifically based research and education for the US No Child Left Behind Act that drew the line between science and non-science. But we also learned firsthand that drawing that line was an act of power, politics, desire, and values, and not an act of clear-headed rational deliberation. But the history of science tells us this, and perhaps we should begin educational research courses by reading books like Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Kuhn's history illustrates that scientists who support normal science are often suspicious of the new and different, and that may not be a bad thing. But I think it's too late to worry about whether this new work is science. The cat's out of the bag, so to speak. Educational researchers have already begun to study the new empiricisms, the new materialisms, and the post-human, and are putting them to work in their projects. As I explained earlier, I introduced the concept post-qualitative inquiry in 2011 to encourage researchers to move past 1980s interpretive qualitative methodology and the more recent positivist qualitative methodology. 
In 2013, Patty Lather and I edited a special issue of the International Journal of Qualitative Studies in Education on Post-Qualitative Inquiry. In 2014, Alicia Jackson and I edited a special issue of Qualitative Inquiry on qualitative data analysis after coding. Alicia Jackson, Lisa Matzay, and I are currently edi editing a special issue of Cultural Studies, Critical Methodologies on the New Empiricisms and New Materialisms. And Hilary Lenz Taguchi and I are editing a special issue of Qualitative Inquiry, Inquiry on Concept as Method. Other special issues of journals, as well as recent edited and authored books, announce that scholars are taking up the challenges of the new inquiry. This new work is both exciting and difficult, and whenever I'm interested in something new, to me at least, I teach a course about it so my smart students can help me think. <clears throat> Two years ago, the wonderful Bronwyn Davies, who was with us at UGA for a semester, and I taught a new doctoral seminar we called The New Empiricisms and New Materialisms, in which we all struggle to think about how to do social science inquiry differently if one thinks with these scholars we call post-structuralists, as well as those writing more recently about the ontological and material terms. What would be new and different about that work? And where would one begin to do this new kind of inquiry it's all well and good to follow Deleuze and Guattari and say, begin in the middle, even if that's probably the best advice. But what does that look like? And how does a new researcher even know whether something is new and different? And how different do you have to be to be new? More practically, how can you increase your odds of doing something new? With those questions in mind, I first review how two theorists who critiqued humanist ontology, Foucault and Deleuze, described the new. Then, given their descriptions, I offer a few practices I think might be useful in getting us unstuck from conventional humanist qualitative methodology whose structure traps us and prevents us from making that ontological turn and moving toward the new. I begin with Foucault, who wrote early in his career in the archaeology of knowledge that it is not easy to say something new. Nonetheless, we know Foucault did say quite a few new things. He also said in an interview two years before he died at the age of 54, I worked like a dog all my life because his project was his own transformation. He said, do you think I've worked like that all those years to say the same thing and not be changed? This is interesting, isn't it? Foucault's warning us not only that doing something new is very hard work, but that scholarly work is personal and not just academic. I agree and tell my students that if they've worked hard to read Foucault and Deleuze and Guattari and Derrida and Barad and Baudrillard and Latour and Bennett and Bergson and Spinoza, they will be changed, and they can't go back. So I tell them that if they're especially fond of themselves as they are, they, <laughs> they best avoid reading this literature and the posts and the new ontologies and go to the movies or mow their yards instead. John Rockman, discussing Deleuze's book on Foucault, explained that for Foucault, the new is not at all what is in fashion, but rather what we cannot yet see or say in what is happening in us, just because it is not already contained in the given structures that govern what we can think. We can't see the new because we're limited by the structures of the present, and we have no language yet to say it. Almost a hundred years ago, Whitehead wrote that pre-existing structures normalize our thinking and produce minds in a groove. But experimentation can help us move out of the grooves of the normal and self-evident. For Foucault, Rockman explained, the new is a pragmatic, experimental matter, something we must actually do for, what, for which there proceeds no determination, no model, no we not even an I. Again, there's no model, no method, no research design, nor an I that exists ahead of experimental work that pushes toward the new and different. 
Deleuze also believed that it is only in a practical and experimental engagement with the world that we can create something new because the new is an outside that exists within this world and as such it may, must be constructed. So it may take some time for us to distinguish the new that is always becoming from the established that is. For this reason, what might be new can't be easily recognized because it's outside our grids of intelligibility. Most importantly, using language from major structuring discourses, language like systematic science, methodological positivism, the solipsism of the Cartesian knowing subject is dangerous because the language of these discourses does not work after the ontological turn. Major dominant language describes what is recognizable, already captured, disciplined, and normalized, what is, not what is imminent but not yet, what could be becoming if we were able to resist the present and think and do it. In fact, that is Deleuze and Guattari's famous challenge. They, they say, we lack creation, we lack resistance to the present. Foucault's challenge in regard to the present and especially to subjectivity is similar. He said we are ob obligated to refuse what we are. In both cases, we must refuse what Deleuze and Guattari called order words that enforce the present. In this case, methodological order words like method, systematicity, transparency, representation, validity, objectivity, and so on. These words force us into is, lock us into what is. It is unlikely they will help us think and do the not yet. So, if we cannot design our research projects before we begin them using the methods or the language and practices of conventional social science research methodologies, what do we do? Where do we begin? My students certainly ask me this question. And I have begun to recommend some specific practices that might increase our odds of accomplishing something new in new empirical, new material, post-human, post-qualitative inquiry. These practices are not new and radical, but are, I think, age-old practices of solid scholarship. My first practice for the new uh, is, as I mentioned earlier, to leave conventional humanist qualitative methodology behind, to refuse it. Those of us who've learned it too well will just have to try to forget it. It's simply one approach among others, and we can't take it too seriously. The ontology of this methodology retains the human, non-human, word, thing, representation, real distinctions, which are unintelligible in an ontology in which the separation between subject and object, thought and word, matter and things is an illusion of language. The second practice for the new I recommend to my students is to read a lot, to read more than they ever thought they could read. I tell them it's okay to read a few of the many, many, too many texts that introduce and elaborate qualitative, quantitative, and mixed methods research in the social sciences, but lest their minds get struck, stuck in the groove of methodology, I encourage them to spend their time reading not methodology, but scholars who have written about ontoepistemology for centuries. That historical reading is, after all, the true pleasure of our lives as academics. And I believe inquiry begins by reading the history of ontoepistemology, the history of science, the history of empiricism, so we understand how very differently we've imagined the world at different moments in history, and how some ideas have been taken up <clears throat> and normalized and others refused. In that reading, we begin to understand the very fragile history of the present. I tell my doctoral students, no one can read for you. You have to do it yourself. And those who read a lot can always tell when others don't. I tell them that the most voracious readers know that their beliefs about the world may well be demolished by reading the next book or journal article 
and that at some point that shock to thought is our desire. At some point we no longer want to read books we understand. We crave instead books that are too hard to read, books that seduce us with what Deleuze called an entirely different image of thought. Foucault too wrote about systems of thought so different, about familiar words put together so differently that we realize the stark impossibility of thinking that. It's the impossibilities we find which hint at others we haven't found that lure us into reading the next book and then the next and the next. I tell my students that if they do keep on reading, if they read and read and read, <clears throat> if they let the strange words and concepts wash over them, they will indeed begin to think with them and then begin to live with them. They'll put them to work in their everyday lives. They will understand what Foucault meant when he said we have to give up the we and the I. They'll understand why Deleuze refused the personal pronouns. They will no longer believe or live the human, non-human binary. At some point, these students understand the impossibility of human subjects research as conceived by conventional humanist qualitative methodology. Instead, they grapple with theory. For example, Deleuze and Guattari's shocking ontological statement, there is no longer a tripartite division between a field of reality, the world, and a field of representation, the book, and a field of subjectivity, the author. In this flattened ontology, ordinary distinctions no longer matter. And human bodies, other living bodies, objects, language, representations, concepts like revenge, values like goodness, dreams, the color green, a memory, the weather, five o'clock in the afternoon, and the not yet are mixed, entangled on the surface. There is no depth in this ontology as in structuralism and phenomenology. The human is no longer prior to language, method, and the world. In fact, the human being of humanism is no longer intelligible. It is impossible to think humanist human subjects research when, as Karen Barad wrote, existence is not an individual affair, when humans do not exist separate from the non-human. It's impossible to think humanist human subjects research when, to simplify Deleuze and Guattari, we are always assemblages that are not stable entities that can be broken down into distinct component parts and made to mean, but rather something like machines that are constantly connecting, territorializing, and deterritorializing, becoming. Importantly, assemblages do not s imply interiority, but exteriority. So we would not ask what an assemblage is or what parts it contains, but rather with what it connects, what it plugs into. Again, human being is not independent and self-contained, but mixed with everything else on the surface. The point is that we cannot separate out the human subject in post-human, new empirical, new material, post-qualitative inquiry. Our responsibility is no longer to the privileged human, but to the assemblage, which is always more than human and always becoming. In this age of the Anthropocene, responsibility assumes its full meaning. This brief description gestures toward the ontological image of thought that guides the new empirical, new material, post-human, and post-qualitative inquiry and displaces humanist qualitative inquiry. To repeat, this ontology uses very different understandings of language and human being that we must account for. Once those two concepts in humanist ontology are shattered, we no doubt flounder, but it is from that not knowing that the new might emerge. As Derrida wrote, we understand the value of knowing how not to be there and how to be strong for not being there right away, knowing how not to deliver on command, how to wait and make, make wait. Perhaps not knowing and waiting then describe the style of the new empirical researcher. 
I surely did not understand Deleuze's and Deleuze and Guattari's work together when I first read it early in my doctoral studies, nor do I understand it now. <laughs> Nonetheless, the image of thought enabled by their concepts like hexiety, assemblage, stuck with me ruining conventional humanist qualitative methodology from the start. I am grateful I read Deleuze and Guattari, Butler, Spivak, Foucault, Baudrillard, Lyotard, Derrida, and others we call post before I was overtrained in humanist qualitative methodology, before its methods driven structure took over my thought and practices. To repeat then, my first practice for the new is to put research methodology aside and my second practice is to read theory, and especially in this ontological turn with its new empiricisms and new materialisms, to study ontoepistemology. And what might a doctoral student do next? She may well panic because, <laughs> because her classmates may have begun their studies by following the clear instructions of the plethora of books and journal articles that describe the research process in quantitative, qualitative, and mixed method studies. They have a well-trod path to follow. The third practice I recommend then is to put the theory to work and begin their studies with a theory or a concept or several related theories and concepts they've identified in their reading that help them think about whatever they're interested in thinking about. For example, reluctant readers, the quantified student, gender, or dropouts. If a student is interested in Foucault's theory of power, she should read everything he wrote about power, as well as secondary sources and critiques. If she's interested in Derrida's deconstruction, she should read almost everything he wrote about deconstruction, as well as secondary sources and critique. The same would hold for Leotard's parology and Butler's gender, Barad's entanglement, Bennett's vital matter, Deleuze and Guattari's assemblage, and so on. My point here is that sustained and what Judith Butler called careful reading is required and brings some measure of confidence and expertise so that students understand why they cannot carelessly mix ontologies. To repeat, theories and concepts then guide the study instead of a predetermined research methodology. From among many theories and concepts, the researcher chooses those that help her think about whatever she wants to think about. She plugs concepts into the world to see what happens. If she's confused or stuck, good questions might be, depending on the theory, theory she's using, what would Foucault do next? Would Derrida code data? Would Leotard use the concept triangulation? Would Bennett separate people and things? And the best thing to do when confused is to go back to the text and read the theory, plunge into the words of the scholars who inspire us. Of course, if the theory or concept one has chosen isn't working, choose others. Some may argue that beginning with a theory or concept is just as restrictive as beginning with method, and I understand that argument, which is in fact very close to the positivist rejection of metaphysics. But I believe researchers need something to think with. They need different and even conflicting theories to help them think about the complexity of the world we live in and to imagine other possible worlds. I'm not especially concerned with classifying or labeling this kind of inquiry because post-method, after-method, post-qualitative methodology Every study will be different and unclassifiable, which will no doubt make some uneasy. I can imagine researchers saying, what is this study? We'll have to train ourselves not to look for prescribed method, familiar practices of formalization, and tortured systematicity in our work. A practical concern, of course, is how scholars doing this post-qualitative, new empirical, new material, post-human research Work with institutional review boards who monitor human subjects for possible harm to research participants. My advice is always do not confuse IRB by using big words like bodies without organs. <laughs> uh, 
My students certainly worry about how to work with our university's IRB. How do we explain our post-human studies to people in charge of human subjects ethics review? In the U.S., we've been fighting the creeping control of our institutional review boards for decades. Our IRBs have seldom understood interpretive qualitative methodology and so have contributed to positivizing our studies for some time. For example, one of my colleagues who was doing an autoethnography was required to sign his own consent form. <laughs> Of course, this is, this is absurd, but not so unusual. We have complained so much in the U.S. about IRBs that a National Research Council committee organized by our prestigious National Academy of Sciences has just proposed revisions to our federal law that, if adopted, will eliminate the need for human subjects review for most conventional humanist qualitative studies. The committee recommends that studies that use methods like interviews and observations that are familiar to most people, as well as studies of educational processes and teaching and learning, will be exempt from human subjects review. Further, these exemptions would not be limited to adults. These recommendations, if written into federal law, will produce a sea change in social science research in the U.S. and remove our work from the control of institutional review boards. The rest is up to us. The fourth and final practice I recommend to students after they've given up qualitative methodology, have read and read and read, and have found theories and concepts to guide their inquiry, is to trust themselves. I encourage them to just put to work the practices, the theory, or the concept enables. We might call these conceptual practices. In other words, I tell them to begin with a concept and conceptual practices will follow. I tell them to just do the next thing experimental ontology enables them to think and do. These practices may be quite familiar, what we do when we want to explore anything. For example, we read, we write, we talk with other people, we observe what's going on around us. We may make a movie, paint a picture, run a marathon, who knows. In the name of methods-driven, positivist social science, we have, as the recommendations for revision to the U.S. Human <laughs> Subjects Law, acknowledge over-determined, over-formalized, systematized, and scientized some everyday practices out of all proportion to legitimate them as scientific, but we have completely ignored others. For example, in conventional humanist qualitative methodology, we've mostly reduced research practices to two methods of data collection, interviews and observations, though I doubt the concepts data or methods of data collection are thinkable in new empirical inquiry in which the human has never been separate from data outside it so she could collect it. The point here is that ordinary practices like talking with and observing people don't have to be formalized, scientized, and elevated to the status of the interview and the observation. I'm interested in all the other conceptual practices, inquiry practices we neglect to disclose for example, when I'm deep in a project and stuck, I go for a walk or weed my garden and inevitably get unstuck. I suppose I could call walking and weeding uh, research practices, but why formalize them? And surely we can name reading a research practice, but we don't. We call it the literature review. I'm very interested in conceptual practices that concepts like diagram, entanglement, and vital matter enable. What would one do if one were thinking and living with those concepts? I've noticed that some of my students who are doing this new empirical work are especially drawn to music, others to film, and others like me just write, 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 trying to put words together differently. Such a simple thing putting words together differently, 
that, as we know, can change the world. To sum up, my strongest recommendation is that we not try to force our new empirical, new material, post-human, post-qualitative studies into the structure of conventional humanist qualitative methodology. I can't imagine how it could fit. Instead of beginning with methodology, I recommend putting the concepts and theories of experimental ontology to work using the conceptual practices that are appropriate for a particular study. If we've done our reading, I wager we cannot not put it to work. It will have transformed us. We cannot think and live without it. We will be living it. As Foucault explained, and Deleuze, the new is already in our lives, but we have to make it. It's in the experimental moment of not knowing what to do next because we're not driven by method and methodology that we might push through the grooves of the given and the self-evident toward the new and different in our work and lives. Method will always come at the end, too late to help us when we think back about what we did and why and what we might have done instead and we'll try next time. Thank you very much. Betty, thank you so much for that ke morning keynote. A sense of displacement and panic, and I hope that there's not a great hotline between your US IRE board um, and Australia. But as we know, is quite often those passages, you know, collapse. And in an association such as ours. They're the sorts of issues that we are continuously mindful of. But also, you've offered us so many things to think with, and you've thrown more than enough at us to be able to sustain us throughout the, co the, the conference. And it's fitting, perhaps, that we might acknowledge that there is an, a follow-up session that's going to occur on Thursday afternoon a special event entitled What's Next for Post-Qualitative Research Down Under? And certainly for all of us as scholars, as we work in the Australian context, we're so aware of the travelling, the policy collisions that, ha that have been held. But I guess in the Australian context, we've always seen our association as a very safe place and the, the conference as an opportunity for people to try out, to be able to do things anew. And I think that's the strength of this organisation, to be able to create those spaces. So on behalf of the organisation, something small to put in your luggage. <laughs> So in the next um, section of the program, we'll be presenting both the Australian Association of Research and Education Awards and also the New Zealand Association of Research and Education Awards. So I'd like to invite Professor uh, Bond Lidgard, who's the chair of the committee, to present the AARE Doctoral Research and Education Awards. Um, I'd just like to begin by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting. The AARE uh, Doctoral Award, um, according to our criteria, uh, is intended as a recognition of excellence in educational research by doctoral students. The main criterion for the award um, is excellence, uh, and that will be determined by the contribution made to theoretical 
empirical and or methodological knowledge in education. And then we have a subsequent other uh, set of uh, criteria. This year, the doctoral award uh, has been renamed uh, the Ray Debus AARE Doctoral Award. Uh, Ray, as we saw earlier, uh, passed away in February this year. He was a founding member of our association in 1970, and as Julianne said, he attended every AARE uh, from 1970 through until last year. And we think he's the only person that actually uh, has done that. Ray was made an honorary life member of AARE in 1996. And after his death earlier this year, the AARE executive um, decided to acknowledge and recognise his enormous support and contribution to doctoral education and for doctoral students over many, many years. And I think it's very generous and we should congratulate the AARE uh, executive for making this decision. And I think it reflects the generosity of, of Ray to doctoral students and also uh, to AARE. So I think we should give the executive a big clap. I also would note that um, Professor Glenn Evans, who passed away early this year, when he was president of this association, he created the doctoral award. Um, so there's a connection between Glenn and uh, Ray in that way. But we're delighted today to have with us um, Brian Debus, Ray's cousin, who will just deliver a short eulogy to Ray. So I'd invite you, Brian. Thank you, Bob, colleagues of Ray's over many years and other people who may be in the audience. I too wish to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and the land on which our conference is now being held and to pay my respects both to uh, elders past and present. I'm very deeply uh, grateful for the AWRE for inviting me here but most of all, to acknowledge Ray's uh, contribution to this organisation. I know from discussions with him uh, that he always looked forward to this conference and going through his things, one of the things that he did do was to keep everything on little bits of paper. And every year uh, that he came to this conference, he just would add another date. And so I can put uh, 1914, although he's in absentia. It would be futile for me to try and go over his academic contribution. It would be well known to many people, and I'll leave that to others. I come here today just to make a personal contribution of how I knew him, my big cousin. We came from a family uh, that emigrated to Kangaroo Island on the Solway. He was a Huguenot from Germany. Um, back in 1836. Our forefather um, married twice. He had seven children in both marriages and we come from the last line of the first uh, marriage. Ray came from an extremely humble background. His dad, Eric, um, was uh, in the army and also uh, in the bank. He died very prematurely in 1958, less than three years after Ray came back from Illinois uh, with his PhD. He, his present for his return was the fact that they had moved from their very small rented unit to a house in Malabar. And for Ray, when he came back, there was a room, a study and a desk. He used this desk right up until the Saturday, uh, just prior to his death a couple of days later. He married a Brisbane girl, a Minion, when she was 19 and Ray was born in 21, uh, when she was 21. She was a regular contributor to the Courier Mail. She was a very bright person 
and a very, very uh, beautiful person. Their marriage lasted over the Depression years and through the war years, and through the war years uh, they were separated. Thus, he developed a very, very strong affinity to his mother and looked after her right through uh, to his death, in uh, her death in 1983. One of the things that my task was to do was to finalise all of his affairs. And I found thousands of letters where they communicated, especially when he was in Illinois, but whenever he was away. These letters contained local information, things that were happening at the university. She was his ears while he was away and provided all of the intrigues that she was able to find out. <laughs> One of the things that Ray was meant and expected to do was to study and put his, all, his effort into what he could become. This meant um, probably that he had very few pursuits and being an only child, study was the major thing. But he did develop a lifelong um, interest and love of the water through surfing at Kuji and Covelli, and also uh, his tennis. It was only a week before he went into hospital that he played his last game of tennis. He was very happy also too that the group had picked uh, up a new member who was under 80, all the other members <laughs> being over 80. My relationship started with him a little bit uh, off course because Ray came in with his parents uh, to greet me at the hospital, but unfortunately Matron was in the way and Matron said, no children in here. He was incensed about this because he was 12 and he felt that he had every right to do that. But nevertheless, um, uh, we, the most memorable event that I can remember was the preparation and farewell for him as he left the shores of Australia at the age of the early 20s to go to Illinois for two years. There wasn't telephones, emails or anything else. Letters were the only way of communication. Nobody in our family had ever uh, thought of going to university. He had done it all in getting first class honours and uh, achieving the university medal. But the fact that he was able to get a scholarship, a Fulbright scholarship with travel, uh, meant that he could go. And I suppose the most memorable thing of that was two things. One, the dinner with our family, the whole 16 of us in this little uh, cramped uh, dining room with our 15 uh, members of our family, and we said farewell. One of the people last night noted the beer bottles on the table. Not many of them, but just a few of them, which was the tradition of the time. My excitement was to go out to the Kingsford Smith Airport to see him go on the Super Constellation. This was something special, and he had a, a bed, uh, because the Constellations had them at that time, and he hopped across the Pacific, often staying overnight in different uh, places along the way. When he came back, a PhD, my family was incensed that he was actually sent back to the Department of Education to teach 4B, 5B. But nevertheless, uh, a couple of years later, he actually uh, received his um, promotion to the, the university. We were so proud. Something that nobody in our family exceeded or ever came up to equal. We used to meet on significant occasions. Ray was ever the host, ever formal, and he would assure that words were said and the, the occasion had a sense. He also made sure that he stood uh, until every woman sat. And if somebody needed to get up from the table, he would stand and go and take the chair and pull it out for them. Exasperated, my mother said on one occasion, by God, Ray, why can't you sit down and eat your food and just let me do what I have to do? <laughs> Over the past four or five years, um, we became uh, very close. 
My life was spent, the majority of which, in the, the country, in education too, but at the other end of the spectrum. I was 36 years a principal, but spent most of my life out in the far country area of New South Wales. I had two uh, careers, one through to 2002, and then I was asked by the Department of Education to go back to Menindee, a failing school with Aboriginal population, and I spent seven and a half years. So there was a lot of communication during that time, but more so after I retired, because we were able to uh, gather together more frequently and enjoy the sorts of things. We spent his last Christmas together at our house. And this was a truly magnificent occasion. He said, can, we, can I come early? Can I come early because I want to have that excitement of all the preparation uh, of Christmas. Um, and coming from and being the only child without other family, uh, this was something very special to him. His last birthday we spent together. And one of the things that my grandsons and I do is to attend uh, AFL matches in Sydney as supporters of the Swans. Ray hesitated about going to the uh, Sydney uh, cricket ground and he said, oh, I think we can. I don't think he wanted to repeat the experience, <laughs> even although he enjoyed it. <coughs> Each year, uh, Ray made sure that we made contact for those special occasions, which are birthday and Christmas. And there would be many people in the audience today who would have received such a call. He never missed out. He never forgot, no matter where he was. They were very interesting calls, as most of the conversations I'm sure that anybody who really knew him were. He had lots and lots of questions. He would rarely allow you the clear air to ask a question about his life. He kept that very compartmentalised and very secret. My wife said to him on, on one day, uh, that we could never get any information from him. And why was this uh, not forthcoming? He said, with a twinkle, that maybe she hadn't asked the right questions. <laughs> One of the treasures found after his death was a set of index cards where he ticked off his special calls that he received. And I just brought one of these along. Again, compartmentalised in three different columns, different parts of the family, and he would tick them off. And looking through, I went through just to make sure that I'd been ticked off every time. <laughs> but on, the way, on this one, it says here, in red, delayed. So I must have, uh, must have been late. Um, there were two significant uh, events uh, that we enjoyed, and uh, he really uh, received in the last one a great deal of comfort. The first one was when we, uh, my wife, my two grandsons, went off to Kangaroo Island in, in 2012 for the 175th anniversary of the uh, first Debus to come. And prior to that we had a trip, an eco trip on the Coorong and Ray was able to talk with my grandsons who actually fell on every word that he said and on one occasion, when he wasn't able to get off the boat for an excursion, my elder grandson stayed and talked to him um, and developed a bond that lasted right through to death because in a codicil two days before he died, three days before he died, he actually left his iPad to Reuben because Reuben had talked him into getting that iPad and that whilst he went to the, uh, an adult association to learn how to use it, he used to come to our place for Reuben to actually tutor him at, in two-hour sessions. Um, so that was a very, very special time. And the last one, of course, was that um, in hospital, when he learnt of his um, imminent death, um, we offered to take him home to his unit in Dremoyne and look after him. This was of great comfort to him because he'd been there for 42 years. Nothing had ever changed. Every piece of um, uh, receipt, every paper, every letter, every card was there and it was a great comfort to him. But more so, 
he was able to have the callers ring him on his telephone. And there were so many people, and I, I want to express my appreciation for both Paul and Helen, who were such good friends to him, together with so many other people who rang and called. On one occasion, we had 30 people uh, in the room, just waiting. He had people from every state of the Commonwealth who came, and they repeated a week later uh, for the funeral. So that was a very special time. And he had his full faculties right up to when he died and giving instructions. He was still in command right uh, to the very end. Lastly, um, I'd like to uh, express my thanks also to Jenny Archer over there, who actually will be leading a session, I think, in room N418 um, after morning tea, where she has put together um, this book, uh, which outlines some of his um, memorabilia. It is a memorabilia, it's not a written book, and where people, his friends, have actually um, contributed to it. So I think that will be quite a, quite a good session, um, and I'm looking uh, forward to that. But I'd like to also congratulate the uh, person who will get the award <laughs> and hope that that um, person um, being the first Debus um, of the name in here will know a little bit about the person. And I would hope that this book might be given by AARE to each doctoral person and a page added each time to add on to who got that award so it becomes part of your living history. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Brian. And uh, as Brian said, uh, the motivation and learning SIG after morning tea um, will speak about Ray's contribution. Okay, to come to the award, this year we had 17 nominations, all of the various, uh, very highest quality, and it makes one feel good about the future of educational research in Australia. Uh, sophisticated in every way, all of them. The committee that makes the decision, I chair it, and it's a wonderful committee of smart, intelligent, very decent human beings. Uh, Professor Lynn Yates at the University of Melbourne, uh, Professor Helen Watt from Monash, who of course was Ray Devis's doctoral student, and Professor Jennifer Sumption from Charles Sturt University. What impresses me about them um, is that they are able to make decisions about theses which are methodologically and theoretically a long way from their interests, but they're able uh, to see quality outside of their own sort of positioning. And the thing that has amazed me in the years that I've had the privilege of chairing this committee is how we easily come to a consensus about what the best work is. And I think we do have these implicit criteria um, in our head. Um, so to announce the winners uh, this year, and that gives it away, there's joint winners, and I didn't quite know how I should announce them, so I thought alphabetically would be the way. So I'll announce the joint winners of the first and the inaugural winners of the inaugural Ray Debris um, AARE Doctoral Award. I'll announce both of them, I'll say something about each, and after I've said something about each, I'd ask uh, the recipients of the award to say some words. So the winners of the uh, Ray Debus uh, AARE Doctoral Award this year are, in alphabetical order, um, <laughs> that they were a dead heat, um, uh, Dr Susan Craig uh, from the University of Queensland and Dr Cheryl Jacob from the University of Melbourne. And just one thing, I think those that were nominated, um, it's great now that AARE acknowledges that nomination because I think they were also the very highest quality. And just very quickly, um, uh, Sue Craig's thesis was called a Foucauldian and quantitative analysis of NAPLAN, the category, language background other than English, 
the boat, and English as a second language level. And basically what this thesis does is deconstruct that category in Australia, that acronym Le Boat, language background other than English, and shows what it does is aggregate uh, more privileged migrants, entrepreneurial migrants, their children, with the, the children of uh, refugees, refugee children, and in so doing hides the differential performance and seems to suggest on the face of it that uh, language background other than English students do as well as native speakers um, in Australia. It's methodologically uh, very, very interesting. Um, and I just wanted to read two sentences from each of the examiners. Uh, Professor Stephen May said, this is a fascinating, ambitious, innovative and interdisciplinary thesis that ranks as one of the best I've ever examined, not least because it judiciously inverts the phrase attributed originally to Disraeli about lies, damn lies and statistics. Um, and the other says this thesis is brilliant, um, a critique of high-stakes national English literacy testing. It's outstanding in every way and is the best thesis that I have examined. Um, so I'd ask Sue to just come and say a few words. So, and congratulations, Sue. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Brian, for your words about Ray. It, it brought him to life for me, and I didn't know Ray, so thank you. Um, first, I would like to thank the AARE Awards Committee for this award, and would like to acknowledge the late Dr. Ray Debus, in whose honour this award has been renamed. It's a great privilege to have my doctoral research recognised in this way. Wonderful for me, for me, and wonderful for the community of people who supported encouraged and provided timely and considered advice or comment. The project would have been impossible without the support of the Queensland Department of Education, Training and Employment, who allowed me access to a considerable data set for my analysis and who permitted me to visit schools and classrooms. I thank them for that and hope they might consider working with me again. Uh, <laughs> the award may help here. <laughs> Um, of course, it's the greatest joy to have you, Bob, present this award. Um, uh, really, I, I had two really wonderful supervisors, the perfect team, really, Professor Bob Lingard from the School of Education at the University of Queensland and Professor Mark Weston from the Institute for Social Science, also at UQ. Bob, a specialist in the field of education policy, and Mark, a social scientist and expert in quantitative methods. And common to both was a firm commitment to social justice and ethical research practices. I would like to say that the award gives recognition to the mentoring, support, encouragement and interest I received from both Mark and Bob. My project is about NAPLAN. For international guests, this is our national standardised literacy and numeracy test, normed on English as first language. And the statistical category, language background other than English, or LBOAT which is one of the categories for the disaggregation of NAPLAN performance. Given its title, Elboat would seem to be presenting the relationship between language and NAPLAN performance. But since 2008, for every year level of the test, that is for years three, five, seven and nine, this category has shown that Elboat students are as good as or better than non-Elboat students on average. I argue that this suggests a kind of powerful truth this particular truth is that you have, if you have a language background other than English, then this is not going to have, have any influence on how you perform on NAPLAN. But this is not a truth for all Elboat students. It is not a truth for the students who are in the process of learning English as a second or additional language. The problem with the Elboat category is that it takes no account of English language proficiency level. Instead, what I show in my research is that there is indeed a relationship between English proficiency level and NAPLAN performance, and you probably think that's really obvious. Um, but some of our most disadvantaged students are hidden by this poorly constructed statistical category. The wash-on effects of this false truth about language and NAPLAN are catastrophic if ESL programs are downsized, if ESL specialist knowledge is removed from schools, and instead, schools and classrooms are flooded with English as first language literacy responses for NAPLAN performance. These are pedagogically unsound practices for ESL learners. 
In short, Elboat lacks any educative usefulness at all and in fact works against the intended purpose of the education reforms, which is supposed to be about improving equity of outcome for all students. I hope the recognition of my thesis will provide a foundation or contribute to the thinking about how we could transform our monolingual standardised high stakes testing regime when the reality of our times is one of global movement and the reality of our education system and our country is one of multiculturalism and multilingualism. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Cheryl Jacobs' thesis, uh, the title, Seeing with Molecules, Discourse, Artifacts and Children's Meaning Making. And th this is a brilliant thesis, um, I think. Um, it challenges the view that primary school children can't understand molecular structures. And what's often built into chemistry science curricula is that that has to come later under uh, a sort of Piagetian model. The thesis is brilliant in, in many ways. Um, methodologically, um, Cheryl found a young person who actually understood molecular structure and had conversations with the numbers of students um, about that. What I also liked about this thesis, and what the examiners really liked uh, as well, was its theoretical sophistication, its epistemological sophistication, and its working with um, Wittgenstein's concept of um, the hinge. And I just wanted to read uh, what one of the examiners, Rom Hare, said about this thesis. This is an outstanding piece of work. An influential piece of received wisdom is shown to be flawed. The view that primary school children can't um, understand the particulate subatomic, and at the same time an alternative claim about the child's progression to full comprehension uh, is very fully explored and a profoundly important pedagogical procedure was tested out. Uh, and it, it says that this is um, so detailed um, analysis that maybe a book isn't suitable, but Sage Online should make it available to everybody. So please congratulate uh, Dr. Cheryl Jacob. I didn't sleep very well last night. It's, it's a bit like the most gigantic Christmas present you could ever get. That's good. Um, I, in my dreams when I started, I thought maybe I could contribute one little original thing. And that's a really grand thing to, to think. And in a later stage in life to actually uh, pretend that you're going to come back to academia and do something of significance is, uh, is, a, is a, it's a huge dream and I feel like I'm in a dream right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it really is uh, fantastic. I'm a, I, as a long-term teacher, uh, I'm aware of the time. <laughs> and so I'm not going to go into my thesis. You don't want me to start because I just won't stop. Uh, but I, I would like to say that I think how I came to this is just as important as what I did. I think that a valuing of uh, 40 years in the field, in various roles, is uh, something that we perhaps need to consider as a, an association um, to how perhaps we can encourage people who aren't... Uh, I'm an early career researcher. <laughs> and I, th I think um, I really would like to acknowledge every mentor that I've had along the way, um, particularly my mother, who uh, passed away recently at age 97. When I started this, when she was 90, she said, what are you going to do with it? And I, I really hadn't thought about that. It was something that just took me. Because I was writing, I was contracted to write a, uh, an encyclopedia for primary school children. Um, my second, no, my third career was in writing curriculum materials. And a publisher questioned why the words atom and molecule should be in the encyclopedia because it's not in the curriculum. 
<laughs> At the same time I was writing books about environmental education, climate change, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, seeing them on the news every day, in the everyday world, but I wasn't supposed to put it into an encyclopedia because of the curriculum. And that whole range of issues arose for me. At the same time, I was out doing field work with children who were talking about molecules everywhere. <laughs> so the reason of coming can open up possibilities that perhaps you haven't thought of. I started in a Piagetian framework and have come out, I hope, in my conversations with Wittgenstein and Vygotsky, I hope I've added to Vygotsky's work in a little way. May I just say that we're living in a time of change as great as the one that Vygotsky was researching with our new technologies. And I think maybe looking back to Vygotsky and what he did in that circumstance can be very useful. So I will stop there, but I want to thank with all my heart, Dr. Christine Redman, my supervisor, who has been the most amazing mentor, who can perform those two roles of being the official person in the institution and the person who is a, a genuine mentor with the mentee. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.